we're going to be talking about one of the real all-stars of the classical world, Solon, Solon of Athens. Solon, as I say, is one of the really remarkable figures of the classical period. It's difficult for me, uh, for reasons that will become clear uh, later on in the presentation, for me to really introduce to you what kind of man Solon was. So instead, I'd like to open up talking about the myth and the legend of Solon. Solon is truly, as I said, one of the rock stars of classical history. Um, as a very early politician and poet in Athens, he is known to history as one of the seven sta sages of Greece. That is, one of the seven individuals that the Greeks themselves consider to be the fathers of um, culture, philosophy, and political life. And uh, we can see from this quote uh, from classic, class, uh, classicist John D. Lewis just how many people respected Solon and credited him with giving them the basis for their own ideas. So you can see you've got Plato, you've got Aristotle, Demosthenes, Cicero, and then more modern figures. You've got James Madison, Woodrow Wilson. All of these people credit Solon with giving them the building blocks for their own political philosophies. He is so respected, in fact, that he's memorialized all around the world. And I wonder if anyone cares to guess where this might come from? This comes from the House of Representatives in the U.S. Capitol. Solon is memorialized alongside Moses, alongside Justinian, Napoleon, James Madison, Woodrow Wilson. Again, these incredibly important and climactic figures in not only um, the history of Western politics, but really the history of Western thought. There's one problem, though. I can't tell you what kind of likeness that is because I have no idea what he looks like. We have no idea what Solon looked like. Frankly, we know very little about him at all. Solon comes to us from the archaic period in Greek history, the sixth century before Christ. You can see this is one of the very few pieces of artwork that we have from this period. And you can see uh, it's called a kouros. Uh, it's a statue of a youth. And you can see how it's b uh, basically an Egyptian artistic motif that has been adapted by the Greeks. That's how early this is. It bears the hallmarks of an even more ancient civilization. Not only do we not know what Solon looked like or what he was like as a person, we really don't have very many dates associated with his life. We think he lived between 638 and 558, but that's a very approximate guess. The only date we have for sure is 594, the date of his archonship. For those of you who don't know, the archons were the chief magistrates in ancient Athens. They took on the roles that the kings had held in both the um, religious and uh, pol uh, political and judicial spheres of life in the polis or city-state. What little we know of Solon comes to us from two sources, the work of his biographers and the work of his, his own work, um, the, his poetic compositions. Both of these sources are flawed for reasons that we'll go into. For instance, Aristotle and Plutarch. These are pretty famous names. You've probably heard of them. They provide us the best accounts that we have of his life. But they're not really the best. Frankly, they're so far from ideal so as to be, for our purposes, practically useless. Aristotle wrote about two centuries after Solon. Plutarch wrote about seven centuries later. Consequently, the accounts they give us are full of gaps because there is such a hole in the historical record, which is why we refer sometimes to the Archaic Age as the Greek Dark Age. But there are other problems. Neither writer is someone that we would really consider a historian today. Both are writing very much with an agenda in mind. Aristotle was trying to explain the evolution of what was, to him, the contemporary Athenian constitution, the democratic state that was totally unique in the ancient world and has provided such a model for later civilizations, including our own US government. As a result, he's less interested in who Solon was and more interested in what Solon did. But he falls into the trap that many fell into in that he accepts the claims of later politicians that their own reforms are based on Solon's. Solon was a climactic political figure and he was viewed very positively throughout Athenian history. Consequently, most later politicians like to link themselves back to the legend of this incredible reformer who so changed Athens. 
Consequently, we have to discount a lot of what Aristotle says because it's really supposition based on less than reliable political propaganda. Plutarch is even worse because not only does he write significantly later than Aristotle, but he's writing with even more of a bias in mind. Plutarch is a moralist. In his lives, he is trying to educate young Greeks and Romans in how they ought to live and how they ought to lead, because of course these are the children of the elite. As a result, he mines the life of Solon and of the man that he um, considers Solon's equivalent in the Roman world, Publius, who helped establish the Roman Republic, for moral lessons and parallels. The full um, English title of his work is, of course, The Parallel Lives. He's looking for commonalities, for similarities. And as a result, we also have to take what he says about Solon with a pinch of salt. So let's set that aside. Let's set aside the work of those later writers and focus on Solon's own. Focus on not only work that was his, and therefore fascinating in its own right, but also some of the earliest Greek poetry that we have. When we launch into his work, we should keep these questions in mind. What can we really know about Solon, considering the flawed nature of the historical uh, sources that we're using? What can we learn about the policies, the policies that so shaped Athens as it developed from a, a dictatorship under Draco um, to the democracy that has become such a model for civilizations in the Western world? What can we learn about the effects that those policies had on the Athens that he knew on, and on Athens as it evolved? What were his motives? And perhaps most interestingly, what was his perception among the Athenians, both, both the noble Athenians and the commoners. I would argue that based not only on Solon's work, but on only four poems from the corpus that we traditionally consider to be, consider to be Solon's composition, we can reconstruct a real understanding not only of the politico-economic situation as it existed in Athens before his archonship, but as it was after. And we can evaluate him as a real figure in history, as opposed to a literary concoction of Aristotle and Plutarch. Now, the Solonian corpus consists of about 40 fragments. They range on any number of topics. Solon is mostly known as a political writer, um, because he was ultimately a politician, and he was writing with that purpose in mind. However, you can break, um, or rather, I have broken, his work into these categories. Each of these is interesting because they're very diverse. He talks about the polis, the city-state, what he was most concerned with, and he talks about his reforms. But he also talks about the gods, he talks about the human condition, much more philosophical topics. And this presents something of a problem. It is inevitable, considering the age of the corpus, that things have been attributed to Solon that are not truly his own work. And this is indicated mostly in the fact that so many of these poems that bear his name, the poems that deal with the human condition, the gods, have nothing to do with Athens, have nothing to do with Solon, and consequently not only cannot tell us much about him, his life, and his politics, but also are quite dubiously attributed to him. And indeed, interestingly, many of the poems that bear Solon's name have very close counterparts in the works of other poets working in the 6th century BC. Uh, most notably, Theognus of Megara, whose Theognida contains many poems that are clearly alternate, rendi alternate renderings of works that have been attributed to Solon, but have simply mutated, so to speak, uh, in the oral transmission. Remember that the Athens that Solon knew was an oral culture, not a written culture. So the poems that he composed would have been sung and then would have been passed down by word of mouth in much the same way as the Iliad and the Odyssey were. We can also see this in the poems that we know may deal with Attican themes, Attica being the region in which Athens is located, but which have become corrupted or fragmented. And you can see any number of poems here are simply unusable because they are so fragmentary um, or so corrupted that we just can't derive meaningful uh, data from them. Uh, my favorite example of one of these has, is a single word. We're told that this comes from much longer work by Solon. It's the word lentils. Uh, and it's very difficult to say much about Solon's politics from the word lentils. <laughs> there are other examples. Um, poems, for instance, uh, like fragments one through three, deal with uh, situations and events that happened outside of Solon's lifetime. And therefore, even though they bear Solon's name, cannot actually be 
his own work. However, there are four poems that I would argue are in fact Solonian, and I'd like to walk you through each one in turn. At the end, I'm going to open up to questions, and I encourage you to ask me about the process of elimination. That was the main body of my paper. I had to go to Yale, I had to go to Oxford <laughs> in order to find the books that I needed to make these sort of determinations. Um, but if I get bugged in that, you won't be, you'll be here all night. Sure. So, I'd like to deal with, oh dear, I'd like to learn how to use my clicker. I'd also like to talk about fragment 4a. 4a is probably the earliest of these four. It probably dates from before Solon took on the Archonship in 594. It's a piece of propaganda, and it's intensely interesting even from the first word, gignosco, I perceive. And this is fascinating because you can see he uses the, or you can see if you knew Greek, that he uses the first person in the verb. He says, I perceive. And this is very unusual for archaic Greek poetry. Consider the Iliad, consider the Odyssey. They're both in the second person. Sing of the man, muse. Um, there are other interesting things about this because it's basically a screed against the decline of Athens. You can see, sorrows are lying in my breast, says Solon, because what is Athens doing? It's sinking, it's declining. You all can't see it, but I can see it, and we're heading towards disaster. But this is interesting for another reason as well, because it's not all negative. You can see this bit here, eldest land of Ionia. What is Solon on about? Why doesn't he just say Athens? Remember, this is propaganda, and in the same way that today, our political figures like to say that America is the best country in the world, ancient Athenian political figures like to hearken back to the founding myth of Athens. We all know that Athens is under the patronage of Athena, hence the name. But there's also a story that Athens is the mother of the entire Ionian race. The Ionians were one of the four, are one of the four major racial divisions of the Greeks. Uh, you'll know them from the Ionic columns as opposed to the Dorians and the Doric columns. And Athens claimed to be their homeland, their ancestral homeland. So by bringing this up, by bringing up Athens' role as the mother of Ionia, the eldest land of Ionia, he's simultaneously ra raising Athens up while drawing attention to its impending doom. And this was a very real threat. In the neighboring city, Megra, there was not only a decline, but a violent revolution within Solon's own lifetime. There's also um, something interesting in the use of the word, word eldest, in that um, that represents likely an allusion to a taboo in archaic Greek society, which was the mistreatment of the elderly. Fragment 4C is usually paired with 4A. Often people say that it's part of the same work, which is why it has the same number. I would argue, however, it comes from at least five or so years after Solon took on the Archonship, in the middle of his career, because it represents a demand, the sort of demand that you would expect a leading political figure to make. It's a demand against the wealthy, those who have a surfeit or a surplus of many goods. I'm going to talk a little bit about the role of the wealthy Athenians in the decline of Athens later on, because one of the longest of the Solonian fragments that I've accepted as genuine deals extensively with how Solon dealt with the wealthy. But for now, it's just important for you to know that what he understood the wealthy Athenians to be doing is pushing the limits placed on them by fate. He's asking them to confine within limits their proud mind. This is very interesting, not purely for a political reason, though it represents a clear attempt on Solon's case to um, curb the abuses of the wealthiest uh, members of Athenian society. It's also interesting because it has a theological um, dimension to it. This idea of limits is one that's ingrained in the early Greek mind. And the best example that I can give you is an example from the Iliad. Um, it's a story about Zeus and his son, Sarpedon. Sarpedon is a hero fighting in the Trojan War. And he is fated to die. The limit that's been placed on him is that he is going to meet his doom at the sword of Patroclus. Zeus knows this, and Zeus has an opportunity to intervene, snatch his son from the battlefield, and deposit him on some safe island in the middle of the Mediterranean. But he doesn't do it. He has a long discussion with Hera, and Hera says, you, you could do this. But if you do so, you are going to transcend the limits placed on you by fate, and you are going to turn what is already a cataclysmic war 
into a disaster of truly supernatural proportions. And so he obeys those limits that have been placed on him, and his only gesture is to send a rain of blood over the battlefield in the, as a gesture of respect. If the king of the gods is bound to obey the limits that have been placed on him by the expectations of Greek society, then who, Solon asks, are the wealthy to try to transcend them? This is also interesting, again, from a more grammatical standpoint, because of the use of the first person plural pronoun, we. This implies the existence of a pro-Solon faction in Athenian society, and that's important. Remember, Solon is dealing with an oral culture. If Solon doesn't have supporters, not only to uh, help him push through his political reforms, but to preserve his memory and to preserve his poetry, then we lose it. If we, don't have, if we didn't have a reason to believe that Solon had supporters who would have continued to sing his songs effectively after his death, we would have to assume that every composition attributed to Solon was in fact the work of another hand. But because he gives us this nice out, because he says there was in fact a we arrayed behind him, we can say yes, there is reason to believe that there were a group of Athenians who would have preserved his poetry. Fragment 33 is interesting because it's not actually in Solon's voice and it's not in the voice of one of his supporters. It's actually in the voice of one of his detractors. It's a Solonian composition, at least according to Plutarch, but it takes the form of a abusive rant, effectively, directed against Solon by a common Athenian. The point of the complaint is that Solon is a shallow thinker. He's a fool. Why is he a shallow thinker? Why is he a fool? Because he is refusing to take the tyranny. This is interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, it reflects um, that Solon, because he wrote this, wanted to draw attention to the fact that he was refusing to take on the tyranny. He never saw himself as a tyrant, and indeed, according to legend, he gave up his power and went into exile after he pushed through his reforms. It's also interesting because it indicates that there must have been some discontent with Solon among the popular classes. And why might this have been so? Solon is a great example of a demagogue in ancient or classical um, society. He has used the support of the common people in order to take a position of power, and there were traditionally two steps that would be taken by these individuals. Firstly, there would be forgiveness of debt, and we'll get into that in a minute. And the second would have been redistribution of land. But we know that Solon refused to do this. So this, the reason that the popular classes would have been discontented with him is not because he exercised supreme power, but because he didn't exercise it entirely in their favor. Um, and this is interesting because it represents a level of moderation on Solon's part that is fairly unusual. Um, many other of these more radical reformers in ancient society, the best example being the Gracchi brother in Rome, had to be killed in order to stop them from going effectively too far. Solon, however, is holding back from that. And we're going to see the significance of that again in his longest fragment, which we're going to deal with in a moment. This last sort of Baroque punishment, you may not be able to see it, but Solon says that he is will, um, rather, this anonymous speaker is saying that he would take on the tyranny even if he was going to be flayed into a wineskin as a result. Um, there is a legend about a fawn who disobeyed the Greek god Apollo and was flayed as a result. His name was Marcius. And um, what's interesting is that this probably reflects a punishment that Solon put into action. Solon probably instituted a death penalty for those who tried to take on the tyranny, not as he had done, but as his predecessor, Draco, had done. Draco was a really nasty piece of work. Um, if you've ever heard of um, the draconian to describe a law, that's where it comes from. He famously said that he could only think of one penalty, <coughs> death, because uh, there was no, there were, all other punishments were too gentle and he couldn't think of one that was any worse so he was not a pleasant guy to live under. Fragment 36 is quite long, so I put the Greek here, and then the English here. Because it's longer, I'm going to give you a few seconds to read over it. Okay. <laughs> a few more seconds. <coughs> now, this fragment seems on its surface to date from the end of Solon's political career. In fact, from after his political career, when he's an old man justifying himself before the court of time. 
But that really doesn't make any sense if you think about it, which is why I reject that hypothesis. No one would have been interested, frankly, in Solon's thoughts after Solon's political career was over, especially because there was a brief period after his archonship that Athens was in fact ruled by a dictator, his cousin, Pisistratus. Consequently, it's far more likely, in my view, that this actually dates from during his archonship, and he has assumed the persona of his older self in order to lend greater credence to his defense of his reforms. And what were the natures of those reforms? I've been kind of hinting at this all the way through. The disaster that was facing Athens in the 6th century was a land crisis, effectively. The very wealthiest Athenians were controlling so much of the land with the small holding farmers that had made up the backbone of the Attican economy were no longer able to survive. They were being driven into massive debt and they were being forced, effectively, to go into uh, mortgages. They were forced to mortgage their own land and that's the significance here with these boundary stones. Big stones have been placed into the fields in order to indicate that the land was mortgaged. But what if you didn't have land? What would be the security for the loan that you needed in order to stay alive? In archaic Athens, and Solon banned this practice, it was, purpose, it was permitted for men to mortgage and sell themselves into slavery. And not only themselves, but their wives and their children. This form of debt slavery was abolished by Solon, but this was the true disaster that was facing Athenian society. If he had not checked it, it is very likely that it would have broken out into revolution. We can also see here that Solon reformed the laws, not only banning wage slavery, not only including a, tyranny for, a punishment for tyranny, but also making the law just for not only the wealthy, not only for the noblemen, but also for the basemen. So he sets himself up in between the wealthy and the poor. He's equally loathed by both. That's why we remember him as a wolf among many hounds, which is a reference to an Iliadic hero, Ajax, because he refused to bow down to the will of the mob, but he also worked for the benefit of the common people against the noble. And that's why he's important, because his ideas help give us this concept of equal justice under law that's written, you can see here, on the facade of the Supreme Court. Solon is a fascinating, and unique figure because he really is the first to express this idea, not that all men are created equal, we're talking about an ancient figure, but the first to say that the law should be impartial, that the law should be blind. And he was the first to curb the more abhorrent practices of those who would try to... Thank you. We only have a few minutes, but if you have any questions. Any of the translations yours? The translations of all but the very longest is mine. Um, and in fact, I think, do we have the hangouts? No. No, we do not have the hangouts. You would have all been able to take home a copy of those translations, uh, but I have one up here if you'd like to read them uh, in more detail. And how long have you been studying Greek? Uh, since September. <laughs> Pre pretty shaky translations, perhaps. Yes? Sebastian, are we likely to learn more about Solon? I mean, is, is research coming well, up with new stuff about him? The, my, one of my primary sources for this was um, the tr a transcript made of a, a colloquium held in The Hague about six years ago. So people are still working on uh, what remains of his corpus, even right, even right now. The problem is that it's very unlikely that um, we're going to come across sort of a cache of his writing. So just recently, for instance, if any of you are familiar with Sappho, we discovered two new poems that are likely Sappho's own work. It's unlikely that we're going to do that um, with Solon, because Solon was writing even that little bit earlier than Sappho. So it's, it's more than likely that what we have is all that we're going to have. But that's not to say that we're not going to have more insights as time goes on. So long studies have gone back and forth. 
a hundred years ago, we thought that everything that was under Solon's name was his, and we thought, we really know who this guy was. About 30 years ago, we said, we have no idea what it is, nothing can be his. So by charting the sort of middle ground and trying to find what are reason what can we reasonably say are his, or at least are based on his own work, because again, it's undoubtedly been elaborated on and embroidered upon in the oral tradition, um, we can still come to some idea of who Solomon was. And it's unquestionable that there was, in fact, a historical figure named Solomon. Thank you. Yeah. Why did you choose to do your project on Solomon? Why did I? Mm -hmm. um, because, well, my, my two big interests are, as Mr. Yelpenini will tell you, are ancient literature and then the law. And Solomon represents a really nice and really early and also sort of not talked about terribly often, confluence of those two things. So I knew that I would be able to do something that people hadn't done before with Solon, because he's sort of a minor figure um, in modern um, classical studies. But he yet represents such a fascinating confluence of the law and of literature that he was really sort of an irresistible figure. Thank you very much.